if if everybody that uh, all the the panelists, all the speakers want to unmute yourselves, we'll uh, we'll get rolling here on some of our questions. I did get a chance to kind of go through these throughout the day, as I've also been listening to your uh, your presentations. Um, I want to start off with one of them, and obviously, if I lead with with one of the speakers, um, it, obviously, it doesn't mean that no one else can chime in. In fact, I think that. We've done a few of these DPR events in the, the last year, year and a half, and it always does seem to go best when I, I call these the sports bar discussions where, you know, we're just kind of relaxing and, and talking amongst friends and discussing different things. So um, even if I happen to single somebody out, like I'm going to single out Troy here in just a second, doesn't mean that anybody else in the group uh, can also you know, put forth their opinions. But Troy, one of the questions was, with the use of a flowable composite in class five preps, um, and, and this was shown in the GC video that was one of the product demos that was running. So this wasn't really directly related to your presentation, um, but they said, doesn't this flowable restorative material have a lower resistance to abrasion from toothbrushing than a packable composite that has a higher percentage of filler particles? And you know, would that, are you, Basically, are you, you know, putting something, you know, you're, you're restoring an area that you might have excessive wear, but you're restoring it with a material that is going to wear more severely than another product. How do you feel about class five uh, flowable restorations? Uh, I think they're probably talking about the GDO universal injectable, probably. I, I believe I so, know. yes. I didn't see that, but, but I mean... So when we talk about class fives, I mean, certainly we can debate this till the cows come home, but really what it comes down to for me is if you're talking about what's causing class fives, more than likely you're dealing with some form of occlusal interferences. So for me, it's evaluating the occlusion first. And if it's something that's an easily adjustable situation, I personally not really sure if it matters what you put down in that zone for the most part, because what's happening is the flexural strengths, as we all know, of the two structure and the bending along the gum lines are certainly a tangible factor that can play a big part of that. So, but at the end of the day, the material choice itself, I don't have a problem using flowables and I've used flowables in there. Um, whether they're superior to a packable composite, I'm not sure that's a thing that we can debate to the, you know, I'm not sure that's a debatable thing or a relevant thing for that matter, especially as we move packables towards flowables in terms of chemistries and how they're put together physical property wise and everything. We've kind of seen the emergence of these two materials coming together, kind of like we talked about at the end of my lectures that we talked about how flowables are becoming more commonplace and the Japanese use them uh, prevalently. And I think what's happening is we're finding that emergence. But at the end of the day, a class five is a tricky restoration. And if you don't handle the components of what's causing it, most of the time you're going to lose anyway. Um, so I think that's kind of a twofold question. But in terms of a universal ejectable being placed in there, Absolutely, it can be used. Obviously, used in right increments, plumberized correctly with an adequate bonding agent will certainly take you a long way. Okay. Anybody else want to chime in on any on any comments with flowables and class fives? Same thing because as I said does. in the morning. Don't stress the bond. Okay. Yeah. We just put in a small amount of flow. I essentially do IDS resin coating on the class fives as well. And I put the peripheral dam around the edge of the of a class five, and that allows you a really accurate polish back. Okay. John, you were going to say something. What did you have? I was going to say that the resistance to stress uh, and abrasion has to do with volume filler fraction of the resin that's being placed, and in the composition of the particles themselves. So it's. You know, you got to know what that is. Typically, things that come out of a syringe have a lower, uh, lower volume fraction filler than our materials that, that paste composites coming out of a tube. So, consequently, generally speaking, are not going to be as wear resistant as as paste composites typically are. Okay, and along those lines, since I've got you talking, John, I'll just jump into a question for you that somebody wrote, which says, Dr. Kanka, I assume this thought is correct for a composite restoration. If you are not using regen bond, then I assume the use of regen flowable is not going to be as effective 
due to the non-bioactive bond already sealing and blocking off access to the dentin cementum interface. Is, is that a correct assumption by that? That is, that's actually correct. Uh, that's the data that came out of the Burgess study that showed that the, the, the two materials, the bio, bioactive adhesive and a bioactive flowable act in concert and you get a synergistic effect. Okay. Okay. Um, Dr. Lawson, um, in deep interproximal areas where you have a dentin cementum margin, this is definitely one that probably everybody will jump in on. But anyway, in deep interproximal areas where you have a dentin cementum margin, do you ever use a glass ionomer in the sandwich technique to help prevent recurring decay due to the GI's seemingly more uh, predictable bond uh, in those areas than composite? Um, I mean, if I'm just gonna be totally honest, I, I mean, I don't just because I just, I, I, ha I haven't, but like in, in theory, it makes sense to me because like, uh, you know, d depending on your, I mean, if I've got a nice rubber dam on there, it, uh, I could get a nice, great bond with a, a bonding composite. If you didn't have great uh, moisture isolation, uh, you know, glass onomers give you some advantages there because they're a lot moisture tolerant. At least that's what we've measured in the lab uh, for cement. So I'm uh, assuming it'd be probably true for restoratives as well. Um, and then as far as like the you know, ability of the RMGIs to release fluoride and help prevent uh, demineralization. We've shown that to be true as well. So, you know, in theory for a high carriers as patient or a patient where you've got problems with moisture contamination, uh, it would make sense to me. Um, I don't know about uh, as far as you're going to have a material with a different modulus underneath your high modulus composite. And we've been trying to mess around with that in the lab, trying to put low modulus materials under high modulus materials and fatigue test them and try to see just the best test we, you know, we try it with micro leakage just so you get more micro leakage when you put high modulus on low modulus and couldn't find micro leakage, but it's not, micro leakage is not a perfect test. So I don't know if there's a problem with that or not, but, um, I was thinking too, the reason I, I selected you for that question, and by, by the way, you're welcome, because I know that was a tough one, but um, I was thinking about it too, because of the curing aspect of this. If you've got something, um, you know, that's a deep proximal area, um, you know, is it, is it better to have something that will, you know, you can, you can bump it with a light cure, but it's going to set on its own no matter what. Um, yeah. Because sometimes, you know, the, even that's one of the problems with the light is like you were talking about in that one picture you had, you know, where the adjacent tooth was blocking the beam. Um, sometimes getting the light into some of these deep proximal areas is difficult as well. Yeah. Was, can I say from experience over the years, one of the things that's really misunderstood in the sandwich techniques is talking about your compressive strength, Nate. Um, most doctors have that use that sandwich would put too much glass ionomer and then it would break down under compressive load. And then you'd actually see the glass ionomer actually lost at the base. And if you really, if you pick the brain of the people that are really lecturing a lot on that, Jeff Bruce should be a really close friend. They're talking about one millimeter increment of glass ionomer, not a lot. And that's the big key down in those deep areas. If, if you're comfortable with that, and the placement, but if you get excess, then you, I think you run into more problems. So, and, and historically you were either in the sandwich camp or you weren't in the sandwich camp basically. And that's where we would use directed shrink, shrinkage um, self-curing materials back in the late yeah, 80s, the 90s before. How do, you, how do you accurately know if you've got a deep area that, you know, Obviously, that's the whole problem is it's deep. How in the world do you predictably know that you're even putting one millimeter that's, down? Therein lies the problem. Yeah. And that's why the auto cures for me, I was much more comfortable with, you know, Bisville 2B. Uh -huh. you know, it was a dual cure or, or later on some of the other auto cures. Well, you know, kind of along those lines, and this would probably for you, Richard, and for you, John, both. You know, there, there are some materials on the market that are, you know, the, the dual cure composites um, that, you know, the idea was that it's a bulk fill because you can, you know, you can set the initial like two to three millimeters of light and then the rest of it will self-cure. 
um, over time. Is that even something, John, is that something that you think would even be practical in a deep box like that? Oh yeah, I mean, I think that's 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 one approach to take. But I, let me let's step back for a second. When I hear the term "we're restoring something to a, uh, a dentin cementum junction," I cringe immediately, because if if there's cementum, you have attachment, and so realistically, if you're prepping down there, there's there's no attachment in those areas. So you're really not ever bonding the cementum. I don't ever believe that ever happens. Now, in a deep box, first of all, we have the light capability to drive. We have high energy lights to drive beams down in there. And I would submit to you, if you can see it, you can cure it. I mean, that's kind of, you know, that may be a different in a crown, you know, you're cutting through a crown and trying to access inside there. That's a, you can get an argument. But if you've got a prep, that's a class two prep, you can see the bottom of that. You can get light at it too. And in the light is sufficient strength to, to activate the materials you have. That doesn't say that, that's not to say that using a dual cure material may have some advantages, but again, something coming out of a syringe that's being expressed out of a syringe is similar to what we talked about before. It's not gonna have the loading that you're gonna want, loading ability and wear, wear assistance that you're gonna need in an occlusal loading area. Now for the bottom of the bottom half of the restoration that might well be suitable. But it would, it would be ideal to me to have a, one of these quasi bulk fill loading materials uh, that was, you know, like bioactive. And you can kind of see that. Right. <laughs> now that, that's a great point. Um, I guess cause that's the part, you know, I was thinking too, would even, would, would chemistry from a standpoint of, you know, like putting aluminum chloride or something down there to kind of dry the curricular fluid. That's a, that's a tough area to work in down there when, when you're in those proximal areas. Um, let me ask you another one, John. Um, a, a, one of the doctors has asked on Desensimax, it says, uh, if you put a layer of Desensimax down, does it co-polymerize with the bioactive adhesive? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. And that obviously that's gonna also, the, there was a question before to you on, you know, if you don't use a bioactive uh, bonding agent, then you're not getting as great an effect. But with Desensimax, you're not getting a blockage. You're actually, that's exactly, basically. Well, it's incorporated. Yeah, it's incorporated into the adhesive. It becomes part of it. Okay, good, good. Um, Dr. Correa, are there, uh, the techniques that you're talking about um, as far as, uh, you know, the, these situations where you're, you know, you're really rebuilding people in, that are, you know, really kind of dental cripples. Um, do you feel that zirconia is is more uh, more difficult against the opposing dentition than other materials, or or do you like zirconia for those types of situations? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, one that I think Dr. Lawson probably knows a lot about as well, because uh, I specifically read his article when, when referencing this. Um, but the whole reason that I go to this polishing of the zirconia is that they've actually, and, and he can probably cite exactly what it is, but um, it shows uh, comparable wear resistance, maybe even less than uh, against enamel if you polish. So it actually becomes a much more gentle uh, approach to um, the opposing dentition if you're using zirconia. Now, if you're glazing it, that's a different story. And that, that essentially will create a, an abrasive situation. But if you're using these polishing, uh, you know, twist polishers or birds or whatever it is, uh, if you polish it, my understanding is that it, it does create a much more friendly environment for the opposing dentition. Okay. And I'm specifically citing Dr. Lawson's uh, the, uh, article uh, with that. So uh, he can expound further much more than I can, I'm sure. So... Yeah, go, go ahead. Seriously, would you like to? By the way, I love the fact that you're no longer in the library now. You're uh, you're in the school. So <laughs> congratulations on making it down there uneventfully. So, so, so John, he bilocated. <laughs> yeah, he, he did bilocate. As a matter of fact, you know, and John and John, what they're all you're learning as young guys is what the real nephologists used to teach us, and that was to disc and polish the glaze off of our porcelains, yep. off of our PFMs yep. when they were posing gold. Yes. And natural dentition, so we wouldn't wear the natural dentition. That was back in 83, 84, yeah. you know, all the masters. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah I, heard, I heard horror stories of zirconia when I was in dental school that it was a sin to use uh, because you would just destroy the, the opposing dentition. And then I heard some other things and, and you know, obviously Dr. Lawson's paper, but um, I felt more confident in using it uh, as of late. So, Dr. Lawson, do you want to expound any at all on uh... Yeah, well, I mean, I guess I could, I mean, the, the study came from um, uh, some of the research that was done by, uh, you know, started with, you know, Dr. Burgess and uh, Dr. Genuvial was one of the guys that were using the wear testing machine. I was using it for measuring composite wear when I was in grad school, and then we switched flipped the machine over to look at the wear of enamel opposing zirconia and found that, uh, you know, the wear of the enamel that was opposing zirconia was much lower than the uh, wear of enamel opposing porcelain. And like, that was kind of why we thought the zirconia was going to be so abrasive was because we saw those mandibular incisors opposing the max layer restored P PFM arches. And we thought, oh man, this zirconia is going to wear the hell out of the opposing tooth. And then uh, what the, 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 the thing though is that like the porcelain, what happens is it's, it's weak. And so it's kind of like, is at starts to wear, it becomes rough and it's like sandpaper and it kind of like wears the opposing tooth structure. And one of the great questions I I had been asked was about Emacs. And so, well, what about Emacs? How much does that wear the opposing tooth structure? And I, a really great analogy is kind of like, uh, the thing about Emacs is it's a finer microstructure than porcelain. So it's like, even though Emacs can start to wear over time, um, it does start to roughen, but it's kind of like smooth, like, uh, 1200 grit sandpaper instead of 320 grit sandpaper of feldspathic porcelain. So it's kind of like a finer grit sandpaper. So even if it wears opposing dentition, it's not, not like what you'd see against porcelain. So porcelain wears like eight times as much enamel as, as like zirconia and, and Emacs is actually relatively similar to zirconia. Interesting. That's good. Thank you. That's good information. Um, Troy, a question that came in, are universal and flowable composites I know we kind of talked a little bit about the differences. Are you still, I mean, are you of the opinion you can't use them interchangeably? So I, mean, I, don't, th I don't think you can, but I'm curious on how you feel. About What's it. the question? On can you use flowable and universal composites interchangeably now? Well, I always use both a flowable and a composite together in terms of a restored, direct restorative in the sense that I always play, say, very fine layer of uh, flowable over my adhesive um, prior to beginning my incremental layering. Do I feel like you can bring these up into occlusion with success? No, I, I, I don't. I'm still of the theory that a packable composite still is, is superseding in terms of strength and wearability and whatnot. Certainly if you're doing a, you know, a slot prep or something where it's very minimal and there's no occlusal load on the two structure at all. Yeah, I don't see why you couldn't bring up some of these heavier filled com uh, flowable composites, but I think it's all case related in terms of wear and relationship. But right. if it's a bigger, broader composite filling or restoration, I'm gonna stick with Stella Packable uh, just because I know the science behind it. I've done it for a number of years with great success. And I just think it's still I think it's still the leader in what I would put in, into a restorative occlusal interface type thing, for sure. Okay. So since, since most of us here today are what I would call kind of materials nerds, somebody asked this one, um, said, I'm assuming that the spherical filler particles uh, based composite types is also in TPH spectra uh, from dense fly serona. Now I know there's spherical fillers in in Tokiyama's Omnichroma, but does anybody here know, uh, you know, know enough to make a comment about the filler particles that are in uh, Densply's TPH spectra? Yeah, I can actually, because I've worked okay. with that yeah, composite. Perfect. Yeah, I've worked with that composite for a while and they are based off the filler morphology. They're 100% based. Um, and that's a very nice composite for those of you who used it in terms of, like I said, once again, you're going to find these composites are just handling so well. They just have that ball bearing effect and everything's very creamy and very smooth. Uh, but yeah, that TPH is based off that filler morphology for sure. So it, like it, the, it, spheres, is that correct? Was that it? I said, they're, like the, they're like the death star spheres. They're like this, the uh, filler part. They're the agglomeration. They're like these little spheres of spheres. Yes. Uh, uh, filler particles. So which that's is a little bit different than like the Japanese composites that have like these 200 or to 300 
nanometer uh, sphere, homogeneous spheres, like the dent, like TPH, I think is maybe almost similar to like Filtex Supreme, where it's like the nano particles in agglomerates, but they're like kind of interesting looking agglomerates look like the Death Star because they're just like a, they're, it's a sphere of a sphere. It's kind of, it's kind of a cool filler particle. That's yeah, it. Troy, Troy's right. Yeah. Yes. They're totally spherical. Yeah. And they come variable sizes. They bounce different light sources, all those type of things. And then when you finish and polish that, you're actually cutting through those spherical formulations, which are resin embedded, smaller fillers of spherical formulations, like he was saying. So that's why you get these very smooth, high shine finishes on these materials is because of that uh, processing. Okay. Well, then this actually, this actually then is taking after uh, heliomolar, which we're using yeah. polymerized agglomerate particles and yeah. end up and then put it back into a resin matrix. I mean, it's, they may be using, you know, sort of nanofills that are sound like they're in the order of 0.2, 0.3 micron, which are 200, 300 nanometers, yeah. you know, as opposed to fume silica being at 0.04 microns or 40 nanometers and some of the particles from 3M ranging from 20 to 75 nanometers. So, I mean, it kind of, it's like new old technology, if you will. <laughs> Right, they do a lot of tumbling of these spherical formulations to kind of make everything dull and smooth and no sharp edges and you know get away from that plucking effect that we all used to get in the uh, older days of composite finishing. It's kind of it's kind of like the uh, the old Who song, "Meet the New Boss, Same as the Old Boss." You know, it just yeah, you know, improved. Um, John, somebody asked, "Can alkacites be used as a liner?" Yes. Okay. Yes, they can. Brought that up. Thank you. Um, Dr. Young, you, you talked a little bit about uh, some layering techniques, and uh, one of our attendees asked, are these techniques applicable to uh, indirect composite layering in the lab as far as indirect composite restorations that are made on the bench? Well, I mean, you're going to get the more, the greater the amount of composite, the more shrinkage you're going to get. But I think it's a, a completely different parameter because the whole idea behind the shrinkage was is that the best bond, you know, it's your your failure is going to be at the weaker link of the bond yeah. in the mouth. And so you're dealing dealing with a different dynamic in the lab. Um, you know, I back in the day when we build Herculite onlays in the lab um, with the quick quick set dyes and stuff, we'd still layer it in and cure it incrementally. We weren't putting a big wad in, but I, it, you weren't dealing with the same issue with dentin stresses. Okay. Hey, Dr. Uh, Dr. Nate, I've got a got one here for you. Um, the photo initiator is not really necessarily a, a shade, you know, used in the shade. It's actually used more to cure, even though it does tend to, to lend itself yellow. Would you agree with that uh, okay is that the full question <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Easy one. Yeah. yeah i think it's, it's like it's like i mean my uh i don't know how how good my explanation was in the presentation but like my understanding of it at, at least is it's like an unintended effect of having that camphor canone in there just like that chemical or whatever happens to be yellow and so it's it's going to tint probably not color but maybe tint the composite a little bit yellow in hue and so uh if you want to have a totally clear composite you just might not be able to use camphorquinone okay so then you go to like ivocerin or something like that right. yeah loosen tpo or something yeah okay that makes that makes good sense that, that was a that was a question i just wanted to make sure that that we covered that one i'm looking over here to see if I've got anything else that we've got here, let's see. Okay, yeah, Dr. Kanka, here's one for you. It says, um, if you, and I don't think I've, I don't think I've read this one to you yet. I'm trying to keep track, but I do lose my place sometimes. If you're not using Regen Bond. Nope, I think I did. So if you're not yeah. using regen bond, then the regen flowable is not as effective. Yeah, I asked you that one already. We know the answer to that one. Okay. Um, so Dr. Korea, on uh, on these cases that you're doing, how much, you know, if somebody comes in, I'm, I'm thinking back to the tetracycline case that you showed um, where the lady walked in, you know, she was a breast cancer survivor and all that. How much time when you scan that to sit down and design a case like that, 
Now, I mean, we all know that, you know, that you've done this quite a bit and you've got experience with it. How much time do you think it takes you to actually design a case like that? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> if I'm doing the whole mouth at a time, that, that obviously is a little bit more extensive. Uh, sure. And I, I, I think, I believe in her situation, I did, I think I delivered the upper teeth I don't remember the, the 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 sequence that I that I did this, but I think I delivered one arch the day that I prepped the other. So um, I was able to design um, those those arches separately, and I think it took me somewhere about hour and a half to two hours to design all the restorations. Um, so you know, once you once you kind of get this flow down, um, again, there's a lot of AI that's built into these software that helps in the design process. Now. You need to go back and make sure that you're adjusting the occlusion correctly and that you have good contacts and, and there is a uh, customization that has to take place beyond what the computer just generates. But, um, you know, a lot of that is just, I get my initial proposal. Um, I kind of, and it's just playing with it. I mean, you, you probably could get that a lot faster and I'm sure that the lab can can do that a lot quicker than, than I, I can. But um, I also want to make sure that, you know, I, I, I'm covering myself on all my bases. So not to say that they don't, the, the, the labs do fantastic jobs uh, and, and they do this all day, every day. So, um, but they can probably do it a little bit quicker because they're doing that. I'm not necessarily spending my entire day designing, um, but that's about how long I think it took me, um, probably about two hours, I would say, to do an arch. How long did it take you in this journey you've been on? How long did it take you to, the, to get to the point where you felt pretty comfortable where it's like, okay, I, you know, I'm not having to think about it anymore. You know, I can just kind of sit down and do it. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, I mean, reasonably uh, because, you know, obviously not everybody's going to plunk down and do a whole arch. At yeah. Once. Right. You, you know, know um, it's been years that I've been using CAD CAM dentistry. So it's not like something that I just all of a sudden was like, Hey, today, I think that I'm going to take on a full mouth rehab case, uh, right. do it all by myself and design and, and, and create all these restorations that is, and, and, it's intimidating. I mean, that's definitely an intimidating uh, thing to kind of take on, but that's also part of the reason why I think it's great to be able to break these into smaller appointments, right? Where you do the provisionalization or, or sort of a temporization to get them where you really want to go at the end of the, of the road and then go and address three teeth at a time, four teeth at a time. So you, you, you shorten those appointments, but you also lessen sort of the mental uh, stress and strain that you put on yourself to make sure that you're, you're, you're doing a your job throughout the whole, the whole process. So that's how I, I didn't, I didn't approach these cases that way, but moving forward, if I were to choose, that's, that's probably how I'd prefer to do it. Okay. One other question on CAD CAM for you. Um, can you use the CEREC Omni scanner with a five axis mill? Yeah, that's a great question and one that I have recent experience with. So in my office in Oklahoma, I actually have a Cerec Omnicam. Okay. And um, unfortunately, I'm not on like the Cerec or the Serona like technology, whatever the thing is where you like stay up with their, their technology. Yeah. Um, mine lapsed apparently. And so I wanted to export an STL for my scanner and they're going to make me pay five thousand dollars to get it oh to, get to do it. So I thought I might as well just buy a new scanner if that's the case. I mean, I, I, the the Omni uh, uh, scan has been great. It, it works really well. Um, we still use it, but I didn't want to invest that that amount of money when I know that there are uh, really good scanners for not too much more than that. So, but yes, you can do that. Uh, the 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 point being is that you can export SDLs but you might have to call uh, Serona and get that license to be able to do it. Okay. Dr. Kanka, and then I think Dr. Young, if you'll kind of chime in on this one too. Uh, in cleaning the tooth uh, prior to starting the bonding procedure, what are your feelings about using hydrogen peroxide or Clorox to clean the teeth? Go, oh, John. I'll, I'll follow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, I'm, it's not what I would choose. Okay. I mean, you just want to clean a tooth. Something like Clean and Boost does a fabulous job of that. If you're just looking to clean junk off and stuff, that, that works really, really well. I, I mean, I understand why somebody would be looking at peroxide or hypochlorite, but I just, it's not in my arsenal. Okay. I will, you know, I will say, and, and this is interesting being in bonding for literally, you know, 35 years, the biggest thing that kind of humbled me was when I started disclosing 
and using aluminum trihydroxide in the bioblaster type of device, whatever you want to use it in. Um, because when you actually start disclosing, you see biofilm that you didn't realize was actually there. And it kind of, you know, it made me kind of wake up call because biofilm is a protein. And if you don't believe that, then with a microscope, um, feel that you've got the teeth clean. And when you see some biofilm, put some etch on it, let it sit and rinse it and see what you see. It'll just, it'll change the color of the, of the stain, but it's going to still be there. And so, you know, to me, that was a really big thing to learn. And now absolutely every time I do any kind of a composite, I'm hitting it with aluminum trihydroxide and cleaning. Okay. I, so last thing, this is really more of a kind of, does somebody have something else? I think they uh, wanted to say something. Uh, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, please I don't go yeah, one of the thoughts, and I and and I'm interested to hear the panel's uh, uh, thoughts on this because um, we're reviewing right now in our journal club. I think next week we can talk about the a the American Academy of Endodontology's recommendation on vital pulp therapy and their big thing of hemostasis after uh, vital pulp therapy is to stop it with um, sodium hypochlorite with bleach, and then of course after you do that, you're going to probably put some type of you know pulp capping agent on top of it and then bond over it with composite. And I know like carbamide peroxide, you always wait two weeks after bleaching before doing uh, bonding because we don't want to have uh, any of that residual oxygen uh, causing oxygen inhibition of our polymerization of our resins. And, you know, I went trying to do this deep dive on sodium hypochlorite to try to find out how bad sodium hypochlorite is for, um, you know, affecting the uh, the polymerization of our composites and bond strength to dent enamel. And I kind of found like mixed results. I felt like personally, but, you know, regardless, I'm still going to probably do sodium hypochlorite to do hemostasis and the endodontists are going to use sodium hypochlorite to do, uh, to clean out those canals. Or if you're, if GP is doing a, a root canal, they're going to use sodium hypochlorite to clean those canals out and then bond to post in there. So, I mean, I guess that's just like a, you don't hear that talked about too much about the effect of sodium hypochlorite on the, on the bond, uh, you know, when we're bonding a, a post or, or bonding on top of vital pulp therapy. But I mean, I guess we don't, what option do we have, for, I guess? Just a thought. No, true. And, you know, <laughs> as someone who, you know, you're probably talking, going back to Charlie Cox's article, and that was the one in which that they talked about using hypochlorite as a, an astringent, if you will, or to, to cease bleeding in a pulp. Uh, because if you couldn't stop it with, with hypochlorite, then you had a fulminant hyperemia in the pulp already, and you were in the case was over. So if you could stop it within about two minutes with a cotton pellet, basically just just moistened and then squeezed out mostly on direct exposure, and it should get, be able to contain the bleeding within about two minutes or so, and then you put something over it. In my case, I like Duralon over that because it's a, a real family friendly material for that. You're saying you're saying stop bleeding without without bleach. Oh no, using using hypochlorite. Oh, okay. but put a little bit on a cotton pellet and then wring most of it out. Yeah, so it was I'm really wrung out. out. It wasn't really liquidy. It was contained right on the site. Yeah, just right. just just yeah, just so it's moist in the, in the pellet, and that's what that's what Charlie was talking about. And since right. then, we've been doing that, and it's with great success if you choose your cases properly. Oh, that's good information. But uh, with that, what would be um, like the ideal situation with that? I mean, when would you not want to do that? Do pulp well, cap? Mean, do I pulp cap? Properly. So I'm I'm just wondering when when you know when is it proper and when it when is it not? Well, okay, you're going to get a lot of opinions on this. But <laughs> sure. No, I, basically, I know. <laughs> you know, but for me, basically, if it, anything's traumatic exposure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that one, I'll go after and do that every time. I'll try that because, okay. you know, I have no curious involvement. And then I would look at the site. I would look at the shape of the lesion because they can, they tend to be triangular as they come occlusally towards the pulp. They sort of largely tend to be triangular. And you look at how much opening there is in the chamber itself and how far is that, that wedge into the pulp. So if the wedge is in the pulp, only a tiny amount, that's one thing, but if you see it gets to be fairly, you know, good sized, mm -hmm. then the, the odds of that not being irrevocably diseased are small. 
So I sort of make judgments based on, on that. And then obviously it's symptomatology. Do you have any lengthy uh, response to, especially heat? Cold, right. how long does it go? But especially if it's responding to heat, then, then it's, it's gone. Yeah, if they, if they come in and, and their main reason for walking in the door is I can't go to Starbucks anymore, that's probably the worst of, you know, that's the worst symptom there is, I think. Yeah, Starbucks is the worst you could, yeah. <laughs> Gentlemen, we're going to wrap it up. I want to I want to finish with one comment here. Unless before I do this, has anybody got anything else they'd like to like to bring up or discuss before? Yeah, I know you said we shouldn't have drinking something on on air, but I, I'm sorry, it's Friday. You know, <laughs> hey, what no, it's do. okay. It's all right. That's uh, totally acceptable for this. So, um, one person made a comment. I thought this was a great comment. He said it's unfortunate that we can't, or he or she. It's unfortunate that we can't be compensated by insurance companies for the time it takes to do these kinds of restorations when you have Delta pain as low as they are in other companies. Um, and it's true that, you know, we've got some really, you know, some, we get squeezed in a lot of different directions on this. And I thought that was just something it's, it's true. You know, I mean, it's, this is highly specific, highly, you know, skilled stuff we do. And uh, it'd be nice if we got compensated properly for it. So I'm going to finish up by uh, reading one thing to everybody here, and then we're going to wrap it up and call it a day. So 